All right, I think we are ready to go. Thanks everyone for coming to SAC Interactive. As I mentioned earlier before the recording, my name's Nolan. We meet right here every third Wednesday of the month, except December, we take that off for the holidays. It's always free, it's always open to everybody. 6.30 p.m. California time. Uh, you can get more info at sacinteractive.com. We're also on YouTube and Twitter and Facebook. Just look up info um, in whichever of those is your favorite spot to find things. And tonight we have Emma Fletcher as our guest speaker giving the latest version of a talk I saw her give at the uh, CF Summit conference earlier this year when we were both in Las Vegas. And it turned out that she is also in Sacramento and she gives rad presentations. So as soon as I found out it was possible to book Emma for SAC Interactive, we set it up and here we are. Uh, Emma, the floor is yours. Go for it. Awesome. Thank you, Nolan. Okay, I'm going to share my screen here. I got a double monitor thing going on. So I think this is going to work out. Can you see a slideshow? Give me some thumbs I up. I see a slideshow. Looks perfect. Okay, awesome. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you, Nolan, for that introduction. Uh, my talk is on the seven mistakes that developers make starting their first business and hopefully how to avoid some of them. Um, I gave this talk at the Cold Fusion Summit. I don't actually know Cold Fusion at all. I'm a Python developer. Um, done a little bit of React, some other things. Um, but I kind of got pulled into this world of building businesses. Turns out I really enjoy it. I'm kind of good at it. Maybe depends what day you ask me. Um, and I love talking about it with other developers, uh, learning about their businesses and helping them start their first business. Mm -hmm. Let's see, next slide. Okay, I like memes. So we'll get some memes in this slideshow as well. Uh, Want to start with a disclaimer. Um, you're gonna make mistakes. You can come to this talk, we can go through all the possible scenarios. Uh, but at the end of the day, there's you're just going to make mistakes. It's part of the journey in building your business. It's how you're going to learn uh, a lot of lessons. It's how I learned a lot of these lessons that I'm sharing today. Um, so, you know, that's just part of how it goes. So that's my disclaimer before uh, we get into the talk. So the first thing I want to share is what my business is. So you can get a little background about me. Uh, my business is actually not a software-based business. It is a DIY electronics kit business. Um, I designed these kits uh, for schools. Uh, I was doing some outreach in electronics. Uh, I have a background in computer engineering. Uh, so these kits are designed for schools, after-school programs, people who want to get into electronics who've never done it before. Um, I started this actually seven years ago as a side hustle when I was working as a software engineer full time. Um, and then I've grown it from there and I started doing it full time in March of this year. Uh, I have a link to our website there. You can buy them. They're a great holiday gift. I'll put that in as kind of my only plug for my business. But if you uh, like electronics, I would love to chat afterwards. So how did I get there to building a successful business that I can work on full time um, that makes some money, enough money um, for right now? Well, I actually had a lot of businesses before that, um, and not all of them are with us today, right? So I went through a lot of failures. So I'm going to run through those because I think they're just as interesting in some ways as the successes. Um, I started my first business called Bytes and Bits Computer Solutions in 2008. Uh, it was an in-home IT business, basically kind of focused on the elderly community. Um, I got a lot of my business through my grandparents' referrals, um, and I did a lot of how do I open this attachment that's a photo of my grandkids? Um, how do I set up a Skype call with my grandkids? How do I print pictures of my grandkids, right? Uh, but that was really my first experience in, you know, helping somebody solve a problem, right? I was kind of good with computers. That was really my only skill um, in that area. But I helped these customers solve this problem and they started to give me money. And I was making $25 an hour, which I thought was great money at the time. Um, I've been working at a movie theater previously for about $7 an hour. So this was a really big step up. 
Um, and they also gave me a lot of free cookies, which was fantastic. Um, from there, I went to college, did some other stuff. Then I started a business called Rocket Department with a few other people here in Sacramento. We're actually based out of Hacker Lab, if any of you have been there. Um, and it was kind of a confusing business with a lot of different goals and maybe not great direction, you know, reflecting back on it. But um, we built installations for music festivals. So that's the photo you see there. Those uh, are about eight foot tall LED towers uh, that light up and they kind of, they lit up with sound of the music. Uh, so we built a few installations like that. Um, and then we would also do contracting work, kind of IoT focused, prototyping, work for people who had an idea, but maybe not the technical skills uh, to build it. And then from there, went on, uh, worked on New Sphere, which was an online preschool during the pandemic. So that was a really interesting kind of crazy ride because everything was going a bit, you know, nuts. And um, I, I was able to meet a lot of great teachers and uh, a lot of great parents and help them in this kind of difficult time in education. So that's kind of my background. There's honestly, there's more businesses than this. These are like my three standouts. I've done a lot. I like to experiment a lot, try stuff, fail, try again, repeat, right? Uh, so my first mistake to cover in this talk is fear of failure. Uh, so like I said earlier, you will make mistakes. Some of them will be little, some of them will be big. Um, but it's okay. Uh, I think it's really good to talk about that openly as a community. Um, we see a lot of these successes, you know, on the cover of Wired or whatever, this billion dollar unicorn. Um, but there's a lot of failure to get there. And, you know, you dust yourself off, get back up, keep going. Um, this fear of failure kind of can be masked in different ways, um, and some people don't even realize that's what's holding them back. Uh, so I see this in a couple different ways. So some person might say, oh, I'm waiting for the perfect idea. I'm, I'm really excited. I'm going to launch a business when I come up with that billion dollar idea. There is no perfect idea. There are tons of great ideas out there to build businesses. They all have pros and cons. None are perfect. Build something and iterate from there. Um, another version of this is, oh, I just need to build one more feature. Then I'm going to launch it. Just one more. But, you know, that feature is supposed to come in three months, six months. The date keeps moving and the launch you know, never happens, right? So one strategy that I've used and I see other people use a lot is committing to a launch date. Um, just look at a calendar. Pick a date somewhere far in the future where you say, I'm sure I'll definitely have all the features done by this date. Uh, tell your friends, tell your spouse, tell everybody you know, tell you know Twitter uh, that you're going to launch and, and hold to it. So even if you don't have all the features done, it's not the perfect version, uh, just launch it. Get it out there. You're going to feel a great weight <laughs> lift off your shoulders once it's out there. And then you can always improve it, right? There's no reason to say that launch version is the final version, and it probably won't be, right? Uh, so number two, I call this shiny object syndrome. It has a few different names. I think developers are really prone to this because um, our industry moves very fast, right? There's lots of new things. We like to learn new tools, pick up new skill sets, right? So it's very easy for us to get kind of lured into this situation where, oh, I got to build with the latest and greatest framework, right? I've got to use the thing that can scale the best, that's the, the coolest thing out there that all the cool tech influencers are talking about. Um, at the end of the day, your customers, they just don't care what you build your product with. It does not matter to them at all. They want you to solve a problem whether it's cold fusion, Python, JavaScript, no code, whatever it is, they, they're just going to kind of stare at you. Unless you're building very specifically for developers, 95% of the population is just going to say, okay, but can I log in? Does it work? Great. You know? 
Um, and the problem with this issue is that if you decide to go with the latest, greatest framework that you're not familiar with, you're just going to lose time on energy on something that your customers don't care about. It's not bringing any value to your customers, right? Um, there are definitely exceptions to this, right? Lots of caveats with everything. Um, but in general, unless you're building very specific technical solutions, nobody cares. Um, and also, you're probably going to throw out version one anyway, so don't worry about it. Number three, uh, kind of related to it, is over-engineering. Um, so in our day jobs as engineers, right, we always want to look for points of failure, right? Plan for what could go wrong um, so we can let our team know and hopefully fix the problem. Uh, but this is not always great for business building, right? You want to prepare for a million and one users. You're probably not going to get a million and one users on day one. You know, we all hope that we do, uh, but it's probably not going to happen. So don't worry about it. Launch the product. When you hit those scaling issues, you can start to solve them. Uh, another version is building everything from scratch, right? You have maybe login systems, importing data, um, hosting things, uh, all of that. A lot of engineers say, oh, well, sure, I could use so-and-so solution, but I can build it better. I'll build it, you know, my own version that's gonna fix my exact problem. It's gonna just take a ton of time to build it, one, and then you're gonna have to maintain it. Um, and especially if you're a solo developer, right, your time is absolutely precious. You cannot be running around building everything from the ground up. Uh, really focus on, can I use someone else's code, someone else's GitHub repo, or even can I not write code at all to solve this problem? Uh, there's a lot of cool kind of MVP launches people have done where there's no code on the back end, right? Like one example might be, say you're, you're doing some calculations, some spreadsheet calculations, right? Uh, maybe you just have an upload form. They upload that to you, it gets emailed to you. You do whatever magic calculations need to be done or run it through kind of a crappy script that isn't published anywhere, and then you email it back to them. And people will pay you for it. If it's solving a problem, People will pay you. They don't care about having a nice UI, right? It's all about solving the problem. And then what that's gonna help you with is you're not gonna write the wrong code, right? You're not gonna spend all this time figuring out um, all these problems that people don't care about, right? You'll do it all manually. And then you're gonna reach a point where you're like, oh my God, I'm getting 25 of these a day. Okay, okay. I definitely need to write the code now, right? And then you know what to build. You build it, automate it, that's what we're good at. And then you have a great business. Okay, I'm on another little, little meme. And this one ties into number four. So number four, so we're all kind of technical people, right? Um, marketing is not our expertise. It's definitely not my expertise. I think there's a feeling of developers that marketing is kind of magic, right? Um, and so when you talk to developers, they're going to build this great some tool and you ask them, okay, how are you going to find users? It's going to go viral, right? Like we've all heard about a tool, like maybe Wordle's a good recent example, right? Where it just went viral and everybody knew about it. Um, that's not a marketing plan, right? That's just wishful thinking. I think this happens because there's some survivorship bias, right? We've all heard about the things that go viral, but they went viral. Unfortunately, there's probably a million other businesses that have launched that thought they were gonna go viral that, you know, nobody's ever heard of. Uh, so I, if you kind of are thinking that route of your cool tools just gonna take off, um, I kind of challenge you to think of a more sustainable marketing plan. I'm not going to get into all the types of that because there's lots of ways to do it. Um, but even something that brings you one to five users a week, if it's consistent, that is worth so much more than going viral, right? Because you know, okay, I need to run 
Google ads for X amount to get this many clicks, to get this many signups, to do this, right? And it really just becomes an equation. So even though marketing kind of seems scary to us or like magic, when you really get into it, it it's just an equation. It's just a problem to solve, right? That's what we're good at. Um, so I would focus on finding a more sustainable thing than going viral. So number five is you have had your attempted viral launch and it has not gone well because most don't. Um, and you're reflecting on that and you say, well, if only I had built X, my viral launch would have worked, right? You're just missing one piece. Or even a worst case is customer says, wow, I really love your tool. We would totally buy it if you only had this feature, right? And you're a good developer, so you say, no problem, right? I can knock that out in two weeks, right? You go back to your computer, you write all the code, you add the feature, go back to the customer, and they say, oh, well, you know, we don't really have the budget for it, right? Or some other reason, right? They were kind of just letting you down easy by telling you that if only you did this, only had this feature, we would buy it. Um, and even if they do buy it, you can get yourself into a difficult situation where, okay, you've built this one-off feature for this one customer. Now the next customer wants a one-off feature, right? And you're suddenly building this totally not maintainable, not cohesive product, right? Because you're just going after one customer here, one customer there. Uh, you got to get comfortable just saying no, right? That's not your vision. That's not the market you're trying to serve. It really hurts sometimes, right, to see that customer walk away. Um, but you also need to focus on what's going to be scalable for you uh, to support for your business. And there's a few ways to focus on building the right features, right? Because it's not that you should never build a new feature. There's obviously going to be things that your main customer base wants. Uh, so a couple ways I've seen this done is some people have a public feature request page uh, that maybe has up, up uh, sorry, that maybe has up votes, right? Or ways for customers to write in and see how interested they are in a specific feature. Uh, so that's a good way to kind of gauge where your customer base is at and what features are going to make the biggest difference. Uh, and then another option, and this works really well in business to business businesses, I think, where you ask for a deposit or prepayment for the feature, right? That customer says, sure, we'll definitely buy it. You say, great, I'm going to spend two weeks building it. Please give me 50% upfront. Right. And if it's something they seriously want and they're seriously considering, they will have no problem doing that. Right. There might be some contract or something you need to sign to, you know, say you're going to deliver it, uh, but they'll have no problem prepaying for it if it's something they really want. If they drag their feet or, uh, you know, then, you know, they're not as serious about it and you can move on to spending your energy on more important tasks. So number six here, building for yourself and other developers. Now, this could be a controversial one when I talk to people. So with all things, big asterisk, it is okay to build tools for developers. But I will say they're a very difficult market, right? Developers like to build their own tools, right? That's why they became developers. Um, they often have very specific use cases. Oh, I want to tie my IDE in with GitHub, in with AWS, or whatever it is. And they figure out how they can do it better, right? They say, well, your tool is cool or whatever, but I can always build it better. I could do it this way. I could build it in Python. Uh, so they can kind of be a tough crowd, right? They don't always want to spend money on stuff either, right? If they can build it themselves, why would they pay money for your tool? Um, so I think if the main ideas that are coming to you when you're building your first business are developer focused, I would say get a little bit out of your comfort zone or try and think about other areas that you can have uh, an impact. Um, that might be hobbies that you're interested in. It may be 
problems that other people you know are having, maybe non-technical people, a spouse, a family member, you know, you might be listening to them talk about their job and they'd say, oh, you know, it's awful. We have to do this super manual task, you know, at the end of every quarter or the end of every month for, you know, my accounting business or something like that. And that should be a moment where you think, wow, I could automate that, right? <laughs> I could write a tool that would, you know, help make that better for somebody. You'll be really amazed how impressed people are with relatively simple technical improvements to their workflow, right? We're pretty used to it in our space, right? But when you get out of the technical field and start talking to other industries that maybe haven't had the same developer resources, um, they get really impressed. So like working with teachers through Newsphere uh, over the pandemic, man, they were just blown away by some of the stuff we could do with rosters and um, with notes for the class and sending emails in a more efficient way. Um, and so that was very rewarding too, to kind of bring that technical side, technical improvement to a group of people who maybe hadn't had it before. Another meme for you. You always think it's going to be really cool. Then it ends up being kind of hard. So number seven, and this is my last one, is burnout. And burnout is very real. I mean, I think in all of our lives, it's something that, you know, kind of comes out of nowhere or you feel like it comes out of nowhere. But especially when you're you're building a business, whether it's a side hustle or full-time business, it's very easy to get kind of absorbed into it, right? And you're trying to balance that with, you know, your day job, if you have one, with your family obligations, uh, with resting and everything else you need to do. Uh, it's important to sometimes take a step back. You can either ask for help or you can hire help. Uh, something I did a lot, I still do to this day, is I hire people on Upwork to help me with tasks. Uh, if there's something that I'm not particularly an expert at or I just don't have the bandwidth to do, I will go to Upwork.com, which is kind of a contracting website. There's a few others out there. I think Fiverr is another one. Or even if you just know a friend, right, who has the skill that you need to say, hey, can I pay you for five hours of work, 10 hours of work, you know, so I can offload this and, you know, you can help me out. Uh, it can make a huge difference, right? If you try and do everything all by yourself, you're going to get really tired, <laughs> right, really fast. It's a lot of work. It's really fun. I don't want to put anybody off. It's super fun, uh, but it's also a lot of work. So thinking about just sustainable ways to fit your business into your life, also be okay with going slower sometimes, right? My soldering kit business was not my main thing. I spent, you know, seven years, I'm at the seven year mark here, right? The first couple of years, it was just what I could fit in the weekends, you know, what I could do after work. Sometimes I was like, ah, I can't, I don't have the energy, right? Sure, I could have gone faster, right? Um, but I think I would have reached a point where I was just like, I can't do this and just close the business, right? And so you really got to think that taking care of yourself is taking care of your business too, because you are the founder. You are the most passionate person about this business. There will never be anybody more passionate than you, right? And if you just lose all your energy, fizzle out, right, then your business it isn't going to make it at the end of the day. And it's okay if it doesn't make it, right? It's not the end of the world. But just making sure that you're finding that right balance in your life is really important. And my last takeaway for this is keep it simple, right? People just want something to solve a problem. It doesn't need to be the biggest, coolest, tech breakthrough. You don't need to send satellites to space, right? You don't need to cure cancer. Those, those things are great, right? But if you're building your first business, um, just keep it simple. And it's actually kind of funny because Learn to Solder Kits was a business I started 
because I wanted to launch more advanced hardware products, right? I had this idea of launching some cool IoT products or development boards or who knows what, right? And I was like, okay, there's so much that I don't know about business logistics, about, you know, shipping things, ordering things, production of physical products. Let me start really simple. Let me design a product that people put together themselves. That's the product, right? Like then you get a bag of parts and you put it together. So I don't have to do any of that production stuff. Um, and I have found there are so many interesting challenges in just running a business like that, right? Even though it isn't the coolest, hottest technology, um, there's still a lot of problems to solve. It's super rewarding, right? Uh, and it's something I'm passionate about, right? I get these great emails from students, from parents about this first experience in STEM education and having that moment of success when it lights up um, that gives me a lot of motivation for my business continuing to work on it, right, seven years later. So you don't have to do everything. Focus on something small to start. So some resources that I like, there are tons of resources online. I kind of cherry picked a few of my favorites. Uh, IndieHackers.com is an online community for small business owners. These are mostly people who are bootstrapping their own businesses. So they're not going for VC funding. There's some who do, but a lot of them are bootstrapping them. They're software developers. Um, and they're just trying to find traction and build that business on their own or maybe with a small group. Uh, they're very welcoming people. They will answer questions, give you feedback. So I like that site a lot. Uh, a good podcast is Startups for the Rest of Us. Um, and this is all about building a business from the perspective of a software developer I think they're really real in this podcast, right? I don't feel like they sugarcoat it. They talk about the hard stuff. They talk about the cool stuff. Um, so it's cool to get their uh, perspective. Uh, a couple books that I like. Another one, there's a lot of great books out there, but I've enjoyed these two. Uh, the Embedded Entrepreneur by Arvid Call is a really good one, especially if you're not sure what business you want to build. If you're kind of that stage, like, I want to solve a cool problem, but I don't know who I want to solve it for. The Embedded Entrepreneur is a really good one, particularly the first half of the book. He gives some uh, exercises that you can do to kind of identify different groups you're in, different groups you're passionate about, uh, what kind of problems they have that you can bring your tech background to, to solve. So I really like that one. He's also very active on Twitter. So you can even reach out to him if you have questions about his book. Uh, and then another one is the mom test. And this is a really good framework for talking to customers because you run into kind of this problem where you're like, okay, I've created this cool widget you show that widget to, you know, a family member, a friend, and you're like, hey, this widget is really cool. Don't you think the widget is cool? And of course, your friend, who's a very nice person and doesn't want you to feel bad, is going to say, yeah, that's a great widget. I love it, right? I would pay a million bucks for it. Um, and that's not super helpful to you. Yeah, it's nice, right? But it's not going to be helpful to you in actually building a business. So this is a framework to find your customers and have these conversations with them where you can really get to the root of the problem and get deep with them instead of kind of a superficial conversation where they just tell you, yeah, everything's great. And then any questions? Uh, just for me, if you want to reach out to me, I am very active on Twitter. There's kind of a great group of indie hackers on Twitter as well that I've connected with. I also have LinkedIn. I'm trying to be more active on LinkedIn, so you can definitely connect with me there. And then special thanks to Memeology for the wonderful startup memes. They make a lot of them. You can go to their website, get some laughs when you're having a hard day building your business and know that you're not alone. So that's it. Any questions? Yeah, Ken. 
Um, I'm not sure how this part works, Nolan. So. Um, I, I'm going to jump in here and assist. I'm looking through the chat right now for you. Um, we don't have a terribly large group today, which is good. So folks, if you have a question, feel free to just unmute your microphone and uh, blurt it out. Or if you're not near a microphone or just don't like to do that, you feel free to write it in the chat there and I will dictate the questions uh, for you if that's better. Um, thanks very much, Emma, that was fantastic. Thanks. You're getting lots of compliments in the chat window for sure. Oh, wonderful. wonderful. I just opened it. <laughs> Great Prizo. Thanks for the talk. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Like <clears throat> all kinds of those coming in. So I think everyone is just like processing all the amazingness that they got from a presentation before asking thanks. questions like that. Uh, I guess I'll just ask a question. Yes. Go for it. Thanks, Emma, for the talk. Um, yeah. I I'm interested, um, I guess. What what sort of sacrifices would you say you had to make um to, to really have to like do this business? Because you sound like you sound like you basically are trying to juggle like a job and a business on the side. Oh, that's yeah. No, that that's a great question because there are sacrifices, right? I think for me, particularly a lot of nights and weekends, right? When I was working on this. Um and it was finding a balance. It was like, okay, Saturday is a work day for my business, right? And Sunday is the day that I rest, right? And figuring out what that looks like. I mean, the, the kind of cool part about it at that time, at least I was part of Hacker Lab. And so there's a great community there as well. So yeah, I was working, you know, on my business. I was also hanging out and drinking some beer, right? So I kind of combined those two. Um, so that was definitely hard. And now I'm kind of at an interesting stage where my businesses are making money. Um, but it's not as much money as my engineering salary, right? It is not a software engineering salary. I, I saved up some money over the past couple of years that kind of knew I wanted to do this, wasn't sure on the time frame, right? And it ended up working out that March of this year was the right time for me. Um, but that's definitely a sacrifice that I'm making saying, okay, well, my tech salary was great, right? Loved it, loved the benefits. Um, but I believe that I can build something even bigger and there's trade-offs, right? Get some freedom and some other things that I enjoy. So it's not all about the money. Thank you. Emma, I have a question. You're, yeah. um, so what's your current plan with your business? Are you focusing just on the, the solder kits? Are there other products um, that you're doing now as well? Is there a plan for 2023 to Great branch out or expand? <laughs> Those are all good questions. So I've got the solder kits. That's kind of like my bread and butter, right? I just launched a new kit, which might become kind of a new kit line there, um, which is paper circuit kits is what I'm calling it. Uh, I get a lot of requests from people oh, my kid is super into tech and I want to teach him to solder, but they're six years old. They're five years old. Little too young, right? Depending. Um, so I saw some other people building these kind of one-off projects with uh, paper circuit kits where it's like a piece of paper, some copper tape, right? To build the circuit and some LEDs. So I just launched my first one, seeing how it's going. So far, so good. And I'll probably launch a couple more. Uh, and then I'm going to focus on international sales as well, branching out into that next year. Um, I originally did international sales at the very beginning. It was so complicated <laughs> to send one kit abroad, you know, and I would get like one order every six months and totally forget how to do customs and it would be a huge disaster, right? Closed it down. Now I think we're at a point to reopen. So I'm going to start with Canada. And then I did start another business, right? So I've got Learn to Solder Kits going. I started another business uh, with somebody I've worked with before that is a customer service business for online business owners. And this was a problem that I faced with Learn to Solder Kits. Some other business owners I knew were facing the same problem. So I started this business kind of as an experiment so far going well, right? And we'll see where that goes because that's a whole different kind of area from the soldering kit business. Nice. Um, real quick follow-up question to that. And then there are a few people that I have questions in the chat that I'll read for you. Um, 
if you don't mind sharing, um, are you using Shopify or anything along those lines to oh, power your, your website? Great question. That's a really good question because originally I figured I will design my own website, right? This is one of the mistakes I think developers make. I will make it so much better. I will design my own website. Did that for a while, was not very maintainable. Um, so I do use Shopify. I use almost everything built in on Shopify. I try not to write anything custom for it. Uh, it's just a lot easier for their software developers to, to maintain that. And then I also sell on Amazon. So those are kind of the two sides of my business. And I can look this up directly myself, I guess, later. But I am I feel like I've heard before that if you use Shopify, they have some sort of automatic connection to Amazon to make getting stuff on there easier. Is that correct? They can, yeah. There's there's a lot of ways to do it, right? Okay. Um, and a lot of ways with like shipping and other like all those logistic problems. Right now, mine are totally separate. They just kind of live out their lives. Amazon is probably about eighty to ninety percent of my business. The other percent being Shopify and a lot of purchase orders from teachers. So I've kind of built these relationships with teachers over the years. And that's a big part of my business where I want 100 kits for the semester and I'm going to order them every semester, right? Which is great for my nice. business because I sell them a bunch nice. of kits. <laughs> uh, I see Victor's got his hand up. Why don't you go ahead and ask your question, sir? And then I'll do the chat room stuff afterward. Oh, yeah. Thanks very much, Nolan. Yeah. Um, so, Emma, um, a mm -hmm. question regarding, uh, I think you, you mentioned earlier about hiring people like uh, from Upwork and Fi or Fiverr. So, um, I think it's something that maybe could be an engineering thing, could also be maybe not being a manager kind of thing. Because um, like maybe you as an engineer you prefer to find a tool that solves your problem. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you don't have experience delegating to people. So I just want to find out like how how did you like or what do you, what do you actually delegate to artwork or and how that's, did you learn to do it? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh so really things that I was not an expert in, right? Particularly for like Upwork. Um, I was not an expert in, I could read a lot and maybe become an expert, but I felt it was a waste of my time. So some examples of that are bookkeeping. I hired a bookkeeper. She is fantastic. Sure, I could go learn how to be a bookkeeper. I'm good with numbers, but I got other stuff to focus on, right? So I've hired her and she, her and I have worked together for over two years now. Um, so she's been a great hire. Um, also an employment lawyer. So I do have some W-2 employees now, so they're not contractors. But when I was making that shift, I was like, I don't know how to hire W-2 employees in California with a lot of rules. And I have a very specific question. Uh, so I'll go on Upwork and post, you know, like one to two hours of employment lawyer time. <laughs> so I could just talk to you, right? And, you know, we'll talk about my business. So that's a good one. Um, and then the W-2 employees, those people are kind of core to my business. Uh, so they do packing and shipping, right? And so that's something that's like, that is the bread and butter of learn to solder kits, right? We got to pack kits and ship kits. So I decided to go W-2 on that route. But that was, I packed them myself actually for a long time. And I reached a point where I was like, I can't produce another 250 kits every week or I'm going to lose my mind, you know? With everything I was doing, somebody. Cool. Yeah, thanks. Uh, we've got, uh, let's see here, um, a question in the chat. I hope I'm pronouncing the name correctly. Vadim asked uh, if there are any apps or tools you use to stay organized and keep on course. Great question. But also say this is something that I don't think is my strongest skill. I do try a lot. Um, I've tried a lot of different things. What's working for me right now is I've been using monday.com. I like it because it's very configurable. Um, so I've been doing monday.com and then I do a lot of stuff just in Google Docs, right? I'm a big Google Docs user for writing stuff, sharing stuff, spreadsheets. Uh, if I can get it for free, <laughs> I will try. So I do that with Google Docs. And a recent hire that I've made, which is actually kind of ties into the last question, is I hired somebody to help me as a product manager. Uh, he's somebody I knew previously. And I kind of asked him, hey, would you come on and just like once every two weeks, like let's meet for a couple hours and like 
see if I'm going the right way, you know, like, let's check in. Because I came from a background, which probably a lot of you have had where I worked on a development team, right? It was me, a couple other developers, product manager. And then when I had a question and I was like, how do I prioritize A and B? I would just go to the product manager, you know, and I did that for like 10 years, right? And they would answer my question and we might talk about it. Uh, but eventually I would have a direction to move. And as a business owner, it can be really hard to be like, am I working on the right thing? Um, and though the product manager that I'm working with now, he doesn't really make the decision now. He asks me the right questions so we can get to the place where I know what the right thing to work on is. So that's been helpful. And that that's a new recent development for me. Awesome. We have oh, one more question in the chat. Simone asked, uh, what would be the best way to go about funding your business? Would there be any way to do some business ideas for free? Hmm. I'm not sure what you mean by business ideas for free. So maybe you can kind of clarify that part. Uh, for funding your business, there's a lot of ways to do it. So what I did is kind of considered the bootstrapped way where it's self-funded, <laughs> right? This worked well because there wasn't a ton of overhead cost. Like, yes, I sell a physical product, so there's going to be some overhead, buy the thing, hold the thing, pack the thing, then sell it. But it's not that expensive, right? I had enough kind of developer income. I think I put in probably like 1200 bucks to start, just to give you like some startup costs on it. I think about 1200 bucks. I was like, sure, you know, I'll hopefully get this money back, right? And then from there, got the money back and built that up. Um, you can also go for VC funding. I will say going for VC funding takes a lot of time. And so in my mind, I was like, do I want to spend this money going to find people to fund this idea who then I kind of have to answer to, or, you know, they're going to have their own opinion, or do I want to spend my time working really hard for a long time, you know, self-funding this um, and, you know, hopefully make it there on my own. And so I kind of went with, with that idea. Awesome. Thanks, Emma. Uh, Simone said, thank you in the chat. So I think that answered all of her, en enough of her question uh, there for you. Um, does anyone oh, else have other questions can I, for? Can I add uh, one part to the funding that I just please. thought of? Um, so another way that people kind of do it, I, seeing it kind of done online is they'll fund their business by doing some freelance or something like that. And that depends how comfortable you are with freelancing work, but they reach a point in their business where they're like, okay, I can't work a 40 hour a week job anymore and build my business for whatever reason, but I can work 20 hours a week, right? Still make that developer pay for, you know, my 20 hours or 10 hours and then work on my business the rest of the time. The nice thing about that is you can kind of scale up and down, uh, though there are challenges with freelancing and finding clients and all of that too. But that's kind of another option I've seen some people do. Uh, Simone actually also replied and said she does she does not remember what she meant by um, free business ideas. So we're, we're all off the hook on that one. No problem. <laughs> uh, does anybody else have questions for... Emma or comments to add anything um, while we have the chat open for a little bit longer? Stunned silence. <laughs> uh, I think we're good then. Emma, thank you very much. That was fantastic. I appreciate yeah. you taking time out of your busy day running your multiple businesses to meet here at SAC Interactive That's and tell everyone a whole bunch of incredibly useful info. I. Thank you. Uh, I've heard you talk twice now, and each time I go, oh, yeah, I got to change a couple of things in my own businesses, don't I? And there's always stuff to go back and retooling always. how I'm doing things. Always to learn. And like I said, I'm super available on Twitter. If you're in Sacramento, too, like, let's get coffee. Let's hang out. Uh, I go to SAC Tech Social usually. I like that one. Um, and they just start doing in person again if you're at a point where you're comfortable with that. But it's a cool group, and I'd love to meet you and talk about your business. I was just going to actually ask you if you were going, planning on going to the Sec Tech Social next week. I yeah, it's like I was the night the, before Thanksgiving. <laughs> I know, I know. It's I was on the fence for that reason among a couple others about whether or not I can squeeze in the time to go. But all right, between you mentioning it and you're going to be there, okay. then all right, it's going to be put in pen, not pencil, on my calendar virtually and. Uh, I'll see you at SACTEC Social. 
So, awesome. That sounds great. Can't wait. Thanks again. Thanks everyone for coming and uh, hanging out. We are not doing a meeting in December. We take December off every year for the holidays, but we'll be right back here uh, in January with a talk on CSS and Flexbox. Uh, Scott McAllister, who's a great dude that I've met and the on the conference circuit. We both talk in some of the same conferences around the U.S., and he's going to give that presentation for us in January. So hope to see everyone back here then. Uh, thanks again, everyone, and have a good night.